Hey, it's me, Sam B. In the past few years, we've watched our friends get tricked by sponsored content on Instagram, our loved ones suffer because of pharmaceutical greed, and our mom's houses get filled with serums and cruise pamphlets as they're sucked into multi-level marketing schemes. Since Black Friday and Cyber Monday are upon us, we are taking this opportunity to compile our best pieces about consumerism and greed. Delicious. Let's talk about multi-level marketing. I know you probably flinched when I said that you've likely gotten Facebook messages from someone you had one class with in high school who reaches out like, hey, Slammy Sammy, you look older since we last spoke. You wanna buy some creams? They've changed my life. Hashtag girl boss, hashtag positivity, hashtag side hustle. I married a cop. <laughs> As much as you may hate those messages, the women sending them probably hate them more. They're ensnared in the growing industry of multi-level marketing, or MLMs, which mostly target women. It's a thriving industry run by some of our finest pieces of shit. The Daily Beast reports today on the vitamin selling venture launched in 2009 by a company called the Trump Network. It was a multi-level marketing scheme along the lines of Amway or Mary Kay. The scheme peddled a number of diet products and sham nutritional supplements, including a supposedly customized vitamin regime requiring users to send in a urine sample on the bright side, he gave you a discount if you delivered your urine in person. <laughs> now, what are MLMs? I'll tell you what they're not. Pyramid schemes, because those are illegal. Here's how multi-level marketing works. At the top of our company, we have a person selling, say, protein shakes for dogs. We'll call them P. P makes money by selling skinny bitch shakes, but also by recruiting new salespeople. Let's call them Y, R, and A. P makes money off of everything they sell and also off everything their recruits sell, and they can make money off people they recruit. <laughs> oh my God, what a coincidental arrangement of love. There are tons of multi-level marketing schemes in the United States. There's LuLaRoe, which sells clothing, most famously leggings that look like they were made by Lisa Frank's blind sister. There's Vicalis, which is not dick pills, but fitness shakes and powders, which, spiritually speaking, are still dick pills. And there's my personal favorite, Vantel Pearls. Vantel sells cheap-ass pearls for much more than they're worth in online pearl parties, just like this one, which is actually from a different different seller, but I'm going to show it to you anyway because it is amazing. Hello again, pearlies. Today I am going to be shucking a hot pink pearl. Absolutely gorgeous. This is a juicy oyster. Oh, here it is. Oh. Find my big pink pearl. Just poke around in it a little bit. Mm, I could watch you shuck all day. Seriously, it is great that this lady isn't stuck in Vantel, but if she isn't, why does she have to give creepy hand jobs to oysters? <laughs> MLM companies are thriving. According to the Multi-Level Marketing Industries Trade Organization, the Direct Selling Association, the number of Americans in MLMs rose from 15.6 million to 20.5 million between 2011 and 2016. And three-fourths of those were women. And it's not because women have a burning passion for waterproof lipstick. MLMs are growing at a time when women's options are shrinking. Over the past three decades, the cost of childcare has spiked to unaffordable levels. And since the U.S. also doesn't have anything resembling paid family leave. Many women with kids are forced to drop out of the workplace. There are actually fewer mothers in the workplace now than in the late 90s. How is it worse for women now than in the 90s? Back then, our national pastime was writing articles about whether or not famous children were still virgins. <laughs> MLMs 
prey on this predicament. They promise you can make your own hours, work from home, and be lifted by a group of fellow ambitious women. It's like the sisterhood of the life-ruining pants. <laughs> but while MLM companies are making money hand over fist, the participants are not. 99% of people who join MLM companies actually lose money. And the 1% who do profit do so by recruiting new members and collecting commissions from them before they ultimately give up. Companies like LuLaRoe require an especially steep buy-in. A typical new recruit might purchase thousands of dollars in merchandise, which they do not get to select themselves. Some might be cute and easy to sell, but no one in the fucking world wants to wear leggings that feature a bee crawling up your cooch. <laughs> oh my God, that bee is gonna sting your big pink pearl. <laughs> Then they're stuck with a hundred pairs of ugly ass bee cunnilingus <laughs> leggings and that. And this is true, even LuLaRoe says you can't wear as pants. Fuck you, LuLaRoe. If I just spent my kid's college fund on leggings, I am wearing them as pants, a cape, oven mitts, and I would probably even be buried in them. <laughs> and sometimes the products aren't just ugly. You would open the boxes and it would smell like old food and some of it would come in and you would open the packages and it would be wet. I reached up to my upline and our team page and I said, hey, I got these leggings and they're soaking wet. Has anybody else gotten soaking wet leggings? This is really weird. They smell like mildew. Perhaps like the pearls, the leggings were also harvested from the sea. <laughs> But the founders of LuLaRoe swear up and down that it is not a pyramid scheme. What that is is an uneducated opinion. They haven't looked at who we are because we sell product through to a consumer and it's highly desirable product. That is not a pyramid scheme. Yes, who wouldn't highly desire products like these? <laughs> Stidham's claim is a little shaky, though. The FTC says one of the, I'm sorry, they're ridiculous. <laughs> the FTC says one of the hallmarks of an illegal pyramid scheme is a promise that sellers will make money from recruiting others rather than selling the product. According to former high-level seller Courtney Harwood, LuLaRoe was all about recruiting. They really pushed recruiting. Not so much sales at all recruiting, recruiting, recruiting. And they even said, if it's a warm body, take them. If it's a warm body, take them sounds less like a good business practice and more like John Mayer's personal philosophy. <laughs> the women who sell for MLMs work incredibly hard just to stay afloat, but they'd probably be more successful if they started their own businesses. About 39% of small businesses earn a profit over their lifetime versus less than 1% of MLMs. The success rate is so low, even gambling is a safer bet than trying to sell MLM products, and they are destroying women's finances. So counsel said she invested around $11,000, but despite working more than full-time hours, couldn't make it work, and in November said she was still over $4,000 in debt. Ellie says she got into £10,000 worth of credit card debt in two years. Racks of clothes and piles of leggings are taking over Kimberly Jarrett's house. We're in my living room, <laughs> and this is approximately... I would say about 550 pieces of LuLaRoe. That is horrible, but maybe she can recycle them into something useful, like I did with my beanie baby husband. <laughs> MLMs are the most despicable form of corporate feminism. They use their you-go-girl branding to trap capable, ambitious women in a worsening cycle of debt. If MLM founders actually believed in empowering women, they wouldn't scam them out of their life savings, especially if all they get back is leggings that make it look like you've been bad touched by a bee. You just caught me taking casual, impromptu selfies in front of a flower wall. How did that get in here? <sighs> we can all agree that Instagram is fun and chill and not destroying me inside. It's harmless, right?
Instagram influencers peddle a lot of stuff, everything from sunglasses to sketchy diet drinks, and the latest frontier is medical treatments. What about the uh, FDA? What about the FTC? What about regulation of promoting these products that may not always have the proper recommendations and mm -hmm. OKs? You're just relying on an influencer. And what, if, what does the influencer know about these medications? Do they tell sure. you the whole story? Yes, the same people who failed to teach us how to do cat eyeliner are now giving us medical advice. And some of them are giving that advice to tens of millions of followers. That's scary, especially because they're advertising products that could be dangerous. Last year, blogger Aaron Ziering was paid by the pharmaceutical company Allergan to promote their BioCell breast implants and Botox. Not only did Ziering fail to properly disclose the product's health risks, she posted the ads months after the FDA issued a warning that women using the implant were at risk of developing breast implant associated cancers. Even worse, Ziering dedicated her post to breast cancer survivors. <laughs> Look, I know what we're all thinking. How could Erin Ziering, wife of Ian Ziering, the star of Sharknado's one through six, not be a better arbiter of taste? The only way this could have gone worse is if she ended her post by plugging the next Sharknado sequel, Sharknado 7, this time it's malignant. <laughs> I won't like it, but I will see it. The FDA and FTC have guidelines that regulate commercials to ensure what they're depicting is truthful and safe. They're the reason TV ads tell us to use medicine as directed. Testimonials are paid or cars can't snowboard, but bruh, if they could, it'd be hella gnarly. <laughs> FTC and FDA guidelines can be confusing and it's up to the influencer to interpret them, so usually they just don't. It's been estimated 93% of paid content violates FTC guidelines. That means only 7% of paid content on Instagram might follow FTC guidelines. If Instagram were a restaurant, the health department wouldn't even give it a letter grade. They just make the rat from Ratatouille stand outside and say, no ma'am. <laughs> Here's an example of how a drug that treats psoriasis discloses side effects on television. Don't use if you're allergic to Otesla. It may cause severe diarrhea, nausea, or vomiting. Otesla is associated with an increased risk of depression. Some people taking Otesla reported weight loss. Upper respiratory tract infection and headache may occur. Tell your doctor about your medicines and if you're pregnant or planning to be. Otesla, show more of you. Screw it. At that point, just list the side effects as all of them. <laughs> Here's an ad for the same product on Instagram. There's no mention of seeing a doctor, no side effects, and I guess mentioning severe vomiting would have impacted her likes. The FTC and FDA lack the manpower to sift through millions of SponCon posts, so they rely on consumers to report ads. Consumers are not experts in advertising law. I just reported an ad for Cindy Crawford home because I didn't like how smug Cindy Crawford looked about her couch. <laughs> You're not better than me, Cindy Crawford. We are equals. SpawnCon is everywhere. Last year, Sunsafe RX paid influencers to promote their dietary supplement, and at least one claimed the product could replace the use of sunscreen. This came months after the FDA issued an official warning that no pill could replace SPF for sun protection, followed by a second official warning that said, are you an idiot? <laughs> Of course there's no pill that could replace sunscreen. If there were, we'd have discovered it years ago. No one would have skin cancer and no one would have ever been subjected to that copper tone ad where a dog pervert pulls off a little girl's swimsuit. <laughs> Here's another dangerous example, the Bloom Life Pregnancy Tracker, a wearable device that monitors contractions. It isn't FDA approved because the company says it's for informational use only and not intended to diagnose any condition. But that's not how everyone uses it. It's the pregnancy equivalent of when Hitachi Magic Wand tries to say it's a massager for sore muscles, but everyone knows that just means pussy muscles. <laughs> Bloom Life pays mommy bloggers to advertise other pregnant women, and they provide very few guidelines about what claims influencers should make. Some posts even imply that Bloom Life could save expectant mothers from making an unnecessary trip to the hospital. Like this influencer who posted, I've been using the contraction tracker to know what is and isn't a false alarm. No, you don't know what's a false alarm. You know who knows? A doctor, and soon the taxi driver who's going to deliver your baby. <laughs> You better tip. Even seemingly innocuous remedies can have life-altering consequences. 
Detox teas promoted on Instagram by the Kardashians and other influencers have been blamed for unplanned pregnancies. The tea contains an herb that has a laxative effect which can reduce the absorption of birth control pills. And even if you don't get accidentally pregnant, you will accidentally ruin your favorite pair of jeans. Right. This stuff makes you crap all over the place, okay? That's all the way I can, that's the only way I can say it. It fully makes you poop like a hardcore diarrhea attack. You can get a hardcore diarrhea attack or you can get a hardcore diarrhea attack and pregnant. It's the world's worst game of would you rather. Influencers don't just sell products, they sell lifestyles, and companies are increasingly turning to them because it works. A recent survey found that 57% of millennials are willing to view sponsored content from a brand as long as the posts use authentic personalities. Because nothing says authentic like people who stand on their tiptoes like a Barbie to fake a thigh gap. We can't trust influencers to give us information about medicine. We can't even trust them to give us information about makeup remover. I've obviously tried my fair share of makeup removers, but these are by far my favorite. Logically, I know Shay Mitchell didn't actually touch her face, but emotionally, I want to believe her. In 2019, experts predict that there will be about 5 million sponsored posts on Instagram alone. Companies are taking advantage of the lack of oversight in a way that puts consumers at risk. The FTC and FDA have to monitor SponCon as closely as other ads. We have medical advertising regulations for a reason. It's so people don't die or shit themselves pregnant. Thanks, give me a follow. Now, despite what you may have heard on Fox News, not everyone on the left wants to eat the rich. For one thing, the rich are high in additives like silicone and Viagra and whatever it is that changed the entire shape of Jeff Bezos' torso. I wanna say powdered Vin Diesel. But in this age of extreme inequality, we do need to scrutinize how the super wealthy came by their billions and what that means for the rest of us. In a new segment we like to call Meet the Rich. Meet the Sackler family. Art patrons, cosmopolitans, and believe it or not, almost single-handedly responsible for the nationwide opioid crisis. The Sacklers aren't just rich, they are rich. They have wings named after them at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Louvre, an entire museum at Harvard, a center at the Guggenheim, and if the deal goes through, Post Malone will soon be called the Sackler Post Malone. <laughs> horrifying and yet somehow an improvement. So how do you get to have this many museums name shit after you? By having a fortune of $13 billion, which you, <laughs> whoops, largely made by creating the opioid crisis. The Sacklers family business, which they own in full, is Purdue Pharma, a company best known for developing OxyContin, one of the most prescribed and abused opioids in the United States. Before OxyContin, there was no opioid crisis because most opioid prescriptions were saved for only serious conditions like cancer. <laughs> I wonder what could have changed. There is no question that the marketing of OxyContin was the most aggressive marketing of a narcotic drug ever undertaken by a pharmaceutical producer. The FDA allowed them to make the claim that because it was a long-acting drug, it might, the stress being on the word might, be less prone to addiction and abuse than traditional drugs. There was absolutely no science to support this idea, zero. The Sacklers deliberately marketed a drug as possibly less addictive when they had no reason to believe that was true. That is insanely evil. Even drug dealers will say, don't take too much of this lady. I can tell by your blazer that you cannot handle it. <laughs> After this marketing push, the number of opioid prescriptions jumped from 76 million to more than 200 million over just 22 years. The number of oxycodone prescriptions alone jumped 850%. One family did that, one. The biggest thing my family ever accomplished was getting banned in three consecutive Olive Gardens. <laughs> When you're there, you're family, unless you're a family who steals other people's breadsticks. <laughs> that 
kind of accomplishment must be commemorated. Since they like museums so much, we made them one. Welcome to the Sackler Museum of Stupid Shit the Sacklers bought with their blood money. The opioid crisis that the Sackler family created kills roughly 130 Americans per day. That's at least 200,000 overall and probably many more. That means that the Sackler family has made roughly $20,000 per overdose death or one Toyota Yaris per death. <laughs> beep, beep. If I had caused that much suffering, I would never show my face in public again. But the Sacklers regularly flaunt their wealth, like in a 2013 Vogue spread on the Hamptons weekend house owned by Mortimer Sackler Jr. and his wife Jacqueline Sackler. Oh, sounds lovely. Especially the garden where one of their children likes to grow herbs as a self-taught student of traditional medicines. <laughs> traditional medicines? What a great hobby for the more than 40,000 children in foster care because of their parents' opioid addiction. Maybe they wouldn't be in this predicament if they just crushed up a wholesome gyro root for mummy's headache. Oh, the Sacklers knew exactly what they were doing when it came to pushing drugs. In fact, even after Purdue pled guilty to misrepresenting OxyContin, then-President Richard Sackler, who wins the fiercely competitive title of Worst Sackler, came up with a game plan to keep selling pills. Purdue Pharma, trying to protect sales of its painkiller, OxyContin, made plans to fight back against the emotional messages from mothers with teenagers that overdosed. In an email in the court filing, the company's former president, Richard Sackler, wrote, we have to hammer on the abusers. They are the culprits and the problem. They are reckless criminals. Then he added, and I definitely hope nobody finds this email or they're gonna know I'm a real piece of shit. Rabble, 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 rabble. Oh my God, why would he put that line in there and why is he the Hamburglar. <laughs> the Sacklers were already disgustingly rich before they started the opioid crisis. In the 80s, Mortimer Sackler Sr. had his birthday party in the family's Egyptian wing of the Met. Do you know how rich you have to be to rent out the Met? And you have to buy a bat to fight off the paintings when they come alive at night. <laughs> By the way, at that party, he had the most horrifying cake of all time. That is Mortimer Sackler's face on the Sphinx as interpreted by, I'm guessing, a contestant from Nailed It. But <laughs> terrible cake notwithstanding, they were rich enough to have the fanciest birthday party possible in New York City. They could have stopped there, but they thought, uh, let's go ahead and do an epidemic. The Sacklers actively tried to hide the strength of OxyContin from doctors, which in turn hid the risk from patients. But at least Purdue didn't directly tell patients that the chance of opioid addiction was far from actual fact. Some patients may be afraid of taking opioids because they're perceived as too strong or addictive. But that is far from actual fact. That video actually played in doctor's offices. You know, nothing makes me feel safer when I'm waiting for my test results than an X-Files villain standing on a blood-red background <laughs> telling me to take a pill. Now, some of the Sacklers think it's totally unfair to mention where their money comes from. Joss Sackler, because of course her name is Joss, launched a line of neon hoodies. Now these hoodies are definitely the most fashionable way to say, nobody ever gives me honest feedback. <laughs> Joss, who married into the Sackler family, was so mad that a New York Times article about her fashion line mentioned the opioid epidemic that she said, stop talking about who the men in my life are and review the fucking neon hoodies. <laughs> Joss, queen, no woman should be judged for what the men in their lives do. <laughs> I mean, unless that woman got the money for her fashion line from her husband's billion dollar drug dealership. But fair is fair, so let me take a moment to review your hoodies. <laughs> Fugly. <laughs> now, not all the Sacklers I've talked about share equal culpability in the opioid crisis. For example, only Richard Sackler did this. Richard Sackler complained that he was getting too much information about the dangers of Purdue opioids after setting up one of those Google alerts for news about OxyContin. The filing says his staff immediately offered to replace the alert with something that provided more flattering stories for wow. him. If you're watching my show online right now, that's why the video is titled, Richard Sackler, Handsome Big Penis, Not a Murderer. <laughs> 
But the Sacklers do share one thing. Much of their vast personal fortunes come from the sale of drugs that have killed hundreds of thousands of people. Purdue Pharma is currently being sued and is reportedly considering bankruptcy to protect their assets. Well, fuck that. <laughs> they need to give every penny of that blood money to addiction treatment. So, you pill-pushing aristocrats, save your weirdo cake money and sell your fancy Hamptons homes and give it all to help the countless people you've hurt. Maybe then your family can focus on its next real passion, making apparel for wealthy crossing guards.